The Constitution of the 3rd of May 1791 tells us what the sovereign and independent Commonwealth was capable of. It was the beginning of a path to a 19th century which would have been much better than the 19th century which occurred. The Constitution is the best possible evidence of the Commonwealth's immense vitality. It is worth being remembered and venerated by all who value liberty. The Constitution of the 3rd of May 1791 is celebrated today as the first modern constitution in Europe and as a symbol of Polish sovereignty and independence. The anniversary calls on us to ask a number of questions. What was the genesis of the constitution, both short term and long term? How was it drafted? How was it acclaimed? What does it contain and in what way did it change the Polish-Lithuanian Union? How was the constitution implemented and why was it overthrown? Above all, what does the constitution of the 3rd of May tell us about the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth? The Commonwealth, let us recall, was a community of mainly noble citizens. It did not try to be a fiscal military state or an absolute monarchy like most of its neighbors. And so we should not judge it for not trying to be what it did not become. It should be acknowledged, however, that by the beginning of the 18th century, the Commonwealth had lost its ability to defend itself and was exposed to the manipulation of neighboring powers, especially Russia. They had a convenient tool in the liberum veto, whereby a single envoy to the same, that is a member of parliament, could break up proceedings altogether and prevent any laws and taxes from being adopted. Russian hegemony in the Commonwealth was brutally demonstrated in 1733 when the election of Stanislav Leszczynski as king by the great majority of those nobles who had turned up for the royal election was overturned and a second elector of Saxony, Augustus III, was installed instead. Russian hegemony was still more forcefully demonstrated in 1764 when the screws were tightened Catherine II succeeded in having her former lover, Stanislav August Poniatowski, elected as king. And yet this proved a kind of turning point. She underestimated the new king's desire to reform and enlighten his country. For the reign of Augustus III, although apparently somnolent and politically paralyzed, had taken place against the backdrop of an ongoing economic recovery and a great deal of discussion of solutions for the all too evident problems of the Commonwealth. There was also significant reform in education and these themes came together in the peerist father, Stanislav Konarski, who not only reformed the schools and colleges run by the peerist order, inciting the Jesuits to emulate the Pierists, but also demolished the theoretical underpinnings for the Liberum Veto in four volumes published between 1760 and 1763. The new reign gave a brief opportunity to make significant changes, and the years between 1764 and 1766 were some of the most active of the entire 18th century. They also provoked reactions, both from disconcerted nobles about the pace of change and the potential threats to traditional values and lifestyles, and also the irritation and anger of the Russian Empress, who felt that she had not agreed to such far-reaching changes, for it was in her interests that the Commonwealth remain weak. 
She used the problem of the dissidents, that is, non-Catholic citizens, Protestants and Orthodox, demanding that they be restored to full, equal civic and political rights. Now, this would have been most unusual for the middle of the 18th century in Europe, even though it might sound obvious today. It went beyond the practical religious toleration and freedom of worship that the king and many others would have been happy to concede. The tensions erupted in an armed league or revolt, the Confederacy of Bar, formed in defense of the old faith and liberties of the Polish-Lithuanian nobility in 1768. That, in turn, drew Russia into a long war with the Ottoman Empire, causing tensions in Central and Eastern Europe that were resolved to the satisfaction of the three parties concerned in the first partition of the Commonwealth in 1772. This deprived Poland-Lithuania of about a third of its territory and population. It was, of course, a terrible shock. And in the aftermath of the partition, a much stricter form of Russian domination was reimposed. Indeed, the amputated Commonwealth was compared to a proconsulate of the ancient Roman Empire, with the ambassador Otto von Stachelberg as a Roman proconsul, giving orders to a tributary king. The king, it is true, was permitted slim parliamentary majorities. He was able to make minor improvements in administration. And he had the significant consolation of the activities of the Commission of National Education, which had been founded following the suppression of the Jesuit order by the Pope in 1773. Nevertheless, the army, although improved in organization and discipline, was still tiny in size. Legal codification was rejected by the nobles in the same. And there was a growing sense of frustration at the humiliation of the Commonwealth, its dependent status, as well as the actual abuses carried out by Russian, Prussian and Austrian troops within the borders of the Commonwealth. The tide of change was at the same time building up in education, in culture, and ideas, so that by 1788 there was a ferment of minds among much of the nobility. Stanislav August hoped to direct this into new channels, proposing to the Empress Catherine when he meant to meet her as she sailed down the river Dnieper to inspect the newly annexed Crimea in 1787, that Poland become an unequal ally of the Russian Empire against the Turks. She kept him waiting. She gave him an unsatisfactory and incomplete answer to his proposals. And in the meantime, this helped the political and cultural situation in the Commonwealth to get out of control at the same of 1788. The same of 1788 was confederated. That meant it meant under the auspices of a confederacy. The general councils of confederacies were able to take decisions by majority vote. So crucially, this means that at the same which began in 1788 and entered history as the four years same or the great same, the liberum veto, that requirement of unanimity and the threat of everything being broken up, that did not apply. Very soon, the same was out of control, out of control of the king, out of control of the Russian ambassador. In a fit of enthusiasm, it voted to expand the army from 18,000 to 100,000. It also threw off the Russian guarantee, so-called, of the Commonwealth's form of government and drew closer to Prussia, seeking an alliance with a power that was increasingly becoming the rival rather than the ally of Russia. The same completely marginalized the king, who saw his position crumble very quickly. There was also a revolution in political culture. There were an outpouring of speeches, many of which were published outside the same as well as in it, 
There was a flood of pamphlets. There were riddles. There were satirical poems. There were public demonstrations. There were political sermons, all of which created a kind of greenhouse atmosphere in politics. People came to realize that their words and their decisions had consequences. For so much of the 18th century, people could talk without any real danger of having to take responsibility for what they said. And now those decisions counted. So this was a school in political responsibility. 1789 brought the agreements to new taxes on the landowning nobility, 10% of its income, 20% on the clergy. And this was applied to the expansion of the army. Another important reform at this stage in 1789 was the reform of local government with commissions in the lands and palatinates of the Commonwealth formed of local nobles for the cooperation between the military and civil powers. One of the most effective arguments for decentralization in government. The towns were also awakened politically in 1789 and they began to demand the restoration of long neglected or lost political rights. But by 1790, the Polish Revolution was beginning to be bogged down. The agreements with Prussia was not to everyone's satisfaction. The leader of the Republican part of the same, Ignacy Potocki, was in charge effectively of drafting a new form of government. But his project for the form of government was an enormous, unwieldy project which was mauled in discussions in the same. It was clearly going nowhere. The most controversial problem was the future of the monarchy. Shorn of most of its privileges, but it would be better, it was thought, to have a hereditary monarchy to make the Commonwealth a more attractive ally. But this was deeply controversial given the attachment to the idea of elective monarchy. And then the same itself was running out of time. Sames were supposed to meet every two years. So the next elections were postponed and then postponed again. In the end, they decided they would elect a second set of envoys alongside rather than instead of the first. But by the time those samics were held in November 1790, the nobility was growing impatient. It expressed its views on the state of the Commonwealth with great forthrightness. In particular, it criticized the idea of a succession to the throne. Ignacy Potocki knew that his way had come to a halt. If he was to see a new form of government for the Commonwealth, he would have to compromise with the king. And Stanislav August had been gaining in importance during 1790. Reluctantly, he had accepted the alliance with Prussia, which helped to defuse the criticism that he was a servant of Russia. He also had made use of a wave of anti-aristocratic feeling among ordinary nobles, and his supporters in the same had torn into the pretensions of magnates. Stanislav August was back by the autumn of 1790. Ignacy Pototsky went to see King Stanislav August here in the royal castle in Warsaw on the 4th of December 1790. He invited the monarch to take the lead in drafting the form of government, the constitution, discreetly. And so the king produced a draft. It was sent to Ignacy Pototsky via an intermediary, an Italian cleric in lower orders called Scipione Piatoli. Pototsky made amendments, pushing back in a republican direction before the king picked it up again and pushed back in the other direction. Stanislav Mawachowski, the marshal or speaker of the same, was brought in to help them reach a compromise. And then Hugo Kowantai, a radical, enlightened figure, 
He was brought in as much for his eloquent turn of phrase as anything else. His redaction of the Constitution was close to the final form. And then, towards the end of April, a wider group of advisers and politicians was involved, resulting in some final amendments to the text. In the meantime, attention had been focused on the discussion of the local parliamentary assemblies, the Samix, and also on the law for the royal towns. Now, not all towns in the Commonwealth were royal towns. Perhaps about 40% were, but they were the largest and most important on the whole. The burghers' movement had claimed political participation, but this had resulted in violent opposition from many nobles and their spokesmen in the same. In the end, a compromise was reached. The representatives of the royal towns would have plenipotentiaries rather than full parliamentary envoys. They would have an advisory voice in economic, urban and treasury matters, but they would also be eligible to serve on the government commissions of the treasury and of police. At the same time, they would have all the civil rights and liberties, including the old noble privilege of immunity from arrest without trial, neminem captima vimus nisse iure victum, as well as the self-government they desired. And this was acclaimed unanimously on the 18th of April, 1791. And then it was time for an Easter break. Easter was late that year, on the 24th of April. And the new form of government would be introduced suddenly, giving less notice for potential opponents of the Constitution to hurry back to Warsaw. The date was set for the 5th of May, but it was brought forward to the 3rd of May because inevitably the secret had on out. Now, on the day, there was clearly something going on. The streets around the castle were packed. Guards commanded by the king's nephew, Prince Josef Poniatowski, kept order. The public galleries in this senate chamber here at the royal castle were full hours before the session was due to begin, around 11. Overnight, over a hundred envoys and senators had signed up to support the Constitution. It was expected that about 30 would be opposed, and then there were still about 50 who had to be won over on the day. At the same time, there was an awareness that the international situation had deteriorated badly. The conjuncture which had enabled the Commonwealth to exercise its sovereignty since 1788 was coming to an end. In the middle of 1790, the potential for war between Austria and Prussia had been resolved by a compromise. Sweden, which had begun a war against the Russian Empire in 1788, made peace, peace with honour, in August 1790. There was still a chance of war between Prussia and Britain on one side and Russia on the other in the first few months of 1791. But in the end, Catherine II defied the British ultimatum and by the beginning of May it was clear that there would be no war between Prussia and Britain and Russia. And so, Dispatches from diplomats abroad were prepared. Extracts were to be read out in order to create the impression of a dreadful and imminent threat to the nation's very existence. Such was the tense atmosphere when Stanislav Mawachowski tapped his marshal's staff in order to open the session. There was a demand that from those who had been prepared that this crisis should be explained, that there were urgent dispatches to be read out. The king asked for them to be read out. And despite some protests, they were. And then the king announced that a project which could save the Commonwealth 
had come to his notice, and he asked for it to be read out. This, in turn, sparked protest. They were led by the extreme Republican envoy, Jan Sohozhevsky, who even brought his little son out into the middle of the parliamentary chamber, saying he would rather kill him than allow him to grow up in slavery, for slavery was what being prepared by this new project. He was overruled, but there were sufficient protests uh, against the acclamation of this project, once it had been read out, for a proper debate to be held. And it went on until about six o'clock in the evening. There were many passionate speeches, eloquent speeches, full of the rhetoric steeped in the ancient classics. But there were also learned speeches considering the dilemmas of freedom and order, independence and survival. And then at about six o'clock, with the protests still preventing an overall acclamation, the king raised his hand to speak. He just wanted to, say, to add something further to the debate. He had spoken several times already on behalf of the Constitution. But those who supported the Constitution took this as a sign that he was about to swear an oath to the Constitution. And as the King wrote the next day, I saw that the thing could be done, and so I did it. He rose up on a chair, the better to be seen. He placed one hand on a gospel held by the Bishop of Smolensk and repeated the words of an oath dictated by the Bishop of Krakow. And then afterwards he led all present, except for a few remaining opponents, to the nearby collegiate church, not yet a cathedral, of St. John the Baptist here in Warsaw's old town. And there all took the oath, and there the Te Deum Laudamus, was sung. And then the sacristy bell quelled the crowds, and the king led everyone back here to the senate chamber in the royal castle. And he had the presence of mind to ensure that government commissions and military units would also take the oath to the constitution. Now, the following day, as people took in what had happened, about 30 opponents registered a formal protest. Sohozhevsky even declared he would go to America until he discovered that the President of the United States of America, under the freshly acclaimed American Constitution, had even more central executive power than a king of Poland, according to the new Constitution. At the next parliamentary session, on the 5th of May, it was needed to regularize things as the chairman of the constitutional deputation uh, of the same bishop kosakovsky said this had been done irregularly using the voice of the public rather than established procedure an established procedure had meant that a project should be published three days in advance for it to be thought about and then discussed at length uh, before being voted or acclaimed into law it was then suggested that a unanimous acclamation of all present could resolve the doubts, and the bishop agreed. And so the Constitution acquired the force of law, which had been somewhat lacking on the 3rd of May. So the events were often referred to in the year that followed as the Revolution of the 3rd and the 5th of May. The document, generally known as the Constitution of the 3rd of May, was titled the Law or the Statute of Government. In Polish, that is Ustawa Rządowa. It is short, less than 3,700 words in Polish. Many details were left for later. Other earlier laws were incorporated and it is a persuasive document, regarded as akin to a pamphlet, a catechism, or a civic sermon. Now, it was a constitution in the old sense of the word, that is, a law passed by the same. But it was also a constitution in the new sense of the word, and very soon it began to function as such. 
And that is to say it was a solemn legal framework outlining the form of government and outlining the relationship between government and citizens and citizens and government as well as citizens to each other. The whole was based on the fundamental values shared by the political community. Values of liberty, virtue, equality, justice and the rule of law. It has a fairly straightforward structure being divided into an invocation and a preamble where the rhetoric is quite simply magnificent and into 11 articles and a conclusory declaration. The first article refers to the dominant and national religion, Roman Catholicism. And to reinforce that point, conversion from Catholicism to other religions was prohibited against the advice of the king, but no penalty was specified. At the same time, however, religious toleration was considerably extended, not just from those confessions and faiths which had hitherto been tolerated, but to all people of all faiths who could worship freely and enjoy the protection of the government and the law. The next three articles related to the social order. The first of these related to the nobility. On the face of it, this was a reassuringly traditional, even archaic confirmation of their ancient privileges. And yet there were also phrases in this article which reflected a more modern concern with individual liberty, property and security, a kind of foretaste of a liberal turn in political culture. The third article of the Constitution declared that the law on royal towns, or free towns of the Commonwealth as they were to be called, was part of the Constitution. And it added the persuasive point that the nobles would have allies in burghers in their defence of freedom. One of the most controversial articles since the 3rd of May 1791 has been the fourth, which was devoted to peasants or villagers, the title having earlier been changed from the demeaning peasants or serfs. Now, this is controversial because the article did not abolish serfdom and most peasants remained obliged to provide labour services to their lords and had very limited uh, personal freedoms including no freedom of movement. But yet there were specific traditions uh, where there were contracts they were to be kept. Crucially anyone who immigrated into the Commonwealth from the moment they set foot on Polish soil was a free person able to enter into contracts in a farm or a village or else to move to a town to learn a trade. And this even applied to those who had earlier left the Commonwealth and now re-entered. So there was a perspective for the end of serfdom in years to come. And then there was the language of this article which declared that the peasants were the most numerous and the most useful part of the nation. Quite explicitly, the Polish nation was no longer a noble monopoly. It included burghers and peasants, potentially all inhabitants of the Commonwealth. The next four articles were devoted to the form of government. The fifth is the real heart of the Constitution in that respect. It brilliantly blended the principle that all power in human society derived from the will of the nation, which was an old Polish-Lithuanian Republican axiom which had been livened up by some of the language of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, with the idea that the powers were divided up into three, and this was the principle of the great French jurist and philosopher uh, Charles-Louis de Montesquieu. And those three powers were, of course, the legislative, executive, and judicial powers. And each of the next three articles of the Constitution was devoted to one of those. 
the legislature first, and this was the most important. And this exalted the lower chamber of parliament, the chamber of envoys, which was declared the temple of legislation. Its role was increased at the expense of the parliamentary role of the upper chamber or senate, as well as the monarch. But at the same time, the legislature was declared to reside firmly in the same rather than in the local parliamentary assemblies, which had hitherto instructed their envoys who were supposed to carry them out in the constitution. The envoys were declared as representatives of the entire nation, in them reposing our trust. And this was the same principle that applied in the British Parliament, which was defended by Edmund Burke when his constituents presumed to instruct him. They were elected to exercise their judgment on behalf of the entire nation. This was a major success for the King, who so admired the British Parliament. The article also abolished, with a great deal of persuasive explanation, the Liberum Veto, and, after the present same, the Confederacies, as noxious uh, to the public good. The next article was about the executive power, which was distinguished from the King, who was also included in the article. The executive power was very much subordinated to the legislative power. It was possible for the legislature to interfere in the executive, but not vice versa. Nevertheless, it was considerably stronger than before. The king would preside over a custodial council. Literally, this was the guard of the laws, Straj Prab, which was platonic in favour. The ministers who composed this council were not to sit in the particular government commissions of the treasury, the military or police, although the primate or head of the Roman Catholic Church in the Commonwealth uh, was the head of the Commission of National Education. And the Minister of Foreign Affairs also had direct control over the diplomatic service with the close involvement of the King. Then there was the monarchy, and this was where things got very controversial because it was declared to be elective by families, which was a euphemism, not least because the justification set out the advantages of hereditary succession over elections with all the chaos and danger of interregna and foreign intervention. As for the solution itself, it was a compromise. The Elector of Saxony, the grandson of the late Augustus III, was named as the heir to the throne, but as he had no son, the succession would then pass to his daughter, who would be expected to marry a person whom the same approved, effectively putting an election into the next generation. This left many options open, but created a great deal of uncertainty. And then the eighth article was about the judiciary. This was shorter than those for the legislature and the executive. The key principle here was that the nation, whether at Samix or at the same, would elect its judges directly. There followed two articles on the education of royal children and the arrangement for a regency, which again elevated the role of the legislature in supervision. And the 11th article was on the national force or the army, which was a common responsibility. And the army was empowered to enforce the law in cases of disobedience, which added some teeth to that executive power. And then finally, there was the declaration of the assembled estates, which was about the propagation, the celebration, and the enforcement of the Constitution. Taken together, the Constitution was a compromise between the heritage of noble republicanism, some elements of the Enlightenment, particularly strongly represented by Kowantai, and the limited parliamentary monarchy which Stanislav August admired in England and which was partly inspired by Montesquieu. Above all, this was a persuasive document and it opened a path to the future rather than closing a chapter on the past.
The Constitution was in force for just under 15 months, and during the year that remained of the same itself, many supplementary laws were published in order to fill out the details which had been left vague in the Constitution. The first group of these concerned the legislature, the second group the executive power, and the third group the various different types of courts. There was also a filling out of the arrangements for political participation of the burghers. Not everything could be completed. There was no law passed on the Commission of National Education and the project for the Jews was finally never brought before the same. However, the police commission of the two nations did decide that Jewish residents of royal towns, the free towns of the Commonwealth, were also beneficiaries of the old privilege of Neminim Captiva Bimus Nisse Jure Victum, dating back to the 15th century. You could not be arrested and imprisoned without trial. There was movement in these laws back in a republican direction, away from the shift towards limited and parliamentary monarchy in the law on government itself. And there was also more traditional language. The constitution of the 3rd of May had tended to refer to the nation, Poland, the fatherland, the country. Whereas in the subsequent laws, there was more traditional reference to the Commonwealth and the Kingdom of Poland and the Polish Crown, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the two nations. This was particularly important in a law passed on the 20th of October 1791 called the Mutual Assurance of the Two Nations which was adopted unanimously and declared to be an integral part of the Constitution itself. And this set at rest fears that the separate status of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania had been ended and indeed the not quite but relative silence of the Constitution itself on the matter had left the matter open. This was resolved in October. The status and equality of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was reiterated in return for agreement to joint government commissions. There was by this time a different kind of politics as the new institutions began to bed down. Of course there were still debates and disagreements, some of them quite heated. But politics became much more harmonious and parliamentary business was conducted with dispatch. There were celebrations of success. Incense and cannon smoke was wafted towards the heavens by the strains of the Te Deum being sung in market towns right across the Commonwealth. This was a message of orderly freedom as opposed to the anarchy of old or the revolutionary terror of the French Revolution or indeed the absolute monarchy of the neighbouring powers. It also provided a sense of rather naive optimism about the Commonwealth's prospects in what was still a cutthroat international situation. At the Samix, which were held in February 1792, there was a kind of referendum on the Constitution. Now this was an overwhelming success for the supporters of the Constitution. Of the 78 Samix in the Commonwealth, not a single one criticised the Constitution and only eight passed over the Constitution in silence. All the others expressed thanks or made solemn pledges or swore oaths to defend the Constitution and support for the Constitution was especially high in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, where 27 out of 33 Samix swore an oath to defend the Constitution. So 1791 to 92 was a kind of annus mirabilis. A great deal of work was done to win over the waverers, to persuade those who had doubts, and to celebrate for the first time in many decades a real sense of success and achievement. Alas, it could not last. It is sometimes suggested that 1792 
saw a civil war between Poles. I don't agree. A very small number of magnate malcontents and their clients were so uncompromising in their opposition uh, to the Constitution that they supplicated the aid of the Empress Catherine II of Russia. The Tsaritsa Catherine was determined to destroy the Constitution anyway, but she really wanted a fig leaf of an invitation between, uh, from one part of Poles against another in order to intervene as she had intervened on other occasions in the past. She was deeply disappointed uh, with the numbers and the quality of those who arrived in St. Petersburg to beg her help. She sent in two armies, totaling 100,000 men while the Polish-Lithuanians could put something like 45,000 into the field and perhaps got up to 65,000 mobilized by the end of the campaign. And they fought hard. They had to retreat, but by the time the River Bug was being defended, the resistance was intense. In the Russian baggage trains followed the Confederates. In the Polish crown, this was led by Szczęsny Potocki, the richest magnate of the Commonwealth, assisted by the hetmans or military commanders Ksavry Branicki and Severin Zhevuski and their clients. In the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, there was a separate confederacy led by the brothers Kosakowski, Bishop Yusuf, and his brother Shimon, who was a major general in Russian service. They proved unable to recruit many supporters. And this meant that things seemed still to be in the balance. When the answer came back from St. Petersburg that the Polish request for negotiations had been turned down by Catherine, there was to be no choice in the matter. The king was to submit to the Confederacy of Targovica and order the army to peacetime locations. It was effectively a capitulation. On the 23rd of July, 1792, the king called all the ministers present in Warsaw here to the royal castle for an exceptional meeting. The majority supported the king's decision to accede to the Confederacy and do as the Empress wanted. This is a decision that continues to arouse great controversy. It is true that the Russians still held a numerical advantage, although less than it had been. There was the danger of disaster were the Polish armies to be defeated before Warsaw. Still more serious, there was the danger that the Prussians would invade from the West in a kind of reverse scenario to the one that actually occurred in September 1939, when it was the Soviets who invaded from the East while resistance continued against the Germans from the West. Nevertheless, in doing as the Empress demanded, Stanisław August and those who supported him threw away the best cards they had. There were no more left to play. There was no more leverage. And the submission to the counter-revolutionary regime that was installed by the Russians had to be total. Now, this regime proved to be oppressive and incompetent. Even Catherine lost patience with it. Towards the end of 1792, she was already minded to have a second partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. She didn't have to share anything with the Austrians this time as they were fighting the revolutionary French. But she did give up a part of the West to Prussia to take a great deal more in the East for herself. What remained would be subjected even more firmly to the Russian Empire. Now this intolerable situation provoked an insurrection in 1794, led by one of the heroes of the War of 1792, as well as of the American Revolutionary War, Tadeusz Kościuszko. And then the Russians crushed that too, leaving the remains of the Commonwealth to be partitioned for the third and final time between Russia, Prussia and Austria in 1795. And two years later, in 1797, the three courts resolved among themselves 
that the Kingdom of Poland would never be mentioned again and nothing would be done to recall its existence. Out of sight, out of mind. But that was the same year that legions were formed in Italy who sang the song, Poland is not yet perished. The Constitution tells us what the sovereign and independent Commonwealth, albeit for that brief period of a few years, what that Commonwealth was capable of. It was the beginning of a path to a 19th century for its peoples, which would have been much better than the 19th century, which actually occurred. The Commonwealth was not a failed state, which was put out of its anarchic misery by better governed neighbors. That was, of course, the story that they told. And it is also a story which some Poles have later been inclined to endorse. The Constitution is the best possible evidence of the Commonwealth's immense vitality and potential for growth in those last years before the final partition. It was about evolutionary social and political changes and orderly freedom. And that is why I think we should remember with gratitude the Constitution of the 3rd of May, not just for Poles, not just for other successor nations such as the Lithuanians, Belarusians and Ukrainians of the Commonwealth of the two nations. The Constitution is worth being remembered and venerated by all who value liberty.